Welcome, good morning. Happy Sabbath. It's a beautiful day in Central Florida. We uh, are in strange times, folks. I want to uh, start before we have prayer last week, or the week before, I guess. I had said something I'd like to correct. Uh, Jesus does know when probation is closing. However, only he said the Father knows when he will send him to get his people. I had said that it was about the Holy Spirit according to, in my opinion, Romans 8 that the Holy Spirit knows when that time is too because Paul says he knows the mind of God. So he would know that. But I had said when probation closes, Jesus definitely knows when probation is going to close. So I wanted to correct that. Um, just goes to show that uh, you can't take anybody's word for anything. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you for this time, Lord, this Sabbath. It is going to become such an issue very soon. Lord, it is time for your people to prepare for the most important battle to ever take place in this universe. It's the final movement of the great controversy. And the only way to do that is to know your word inside and out and to be filled with your spirit. As we look at these things, we ask your spirit be here with us and your ministering spirits. Help us to keep this Sabbath holy, to do your will. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. I'm going to continue in Acts, but as I had said a few weeks ago, I want to <clears throat> read out of a book called Maranatha. And... There is actually, as I've said before, things in here that you can only get from this book. They're not available anywhere else simply because there are things that Ellen White had written down that um, just are letters, notes, have not really ever been published or publications that came out in newspapers and pop and circulars in Australia. Uh, a lot of those things we don't know about here. And they are in this book. And th I want to go to July uh, or page uh, 205. And this is kind of an important thing to know. Um, about and to be on the look out for and it's called Sat Satan personates Christ now everything in this book has to do with our situation in the end times everything and I want to read these two pages because it's one and two <clears throat> and then right after that it's satanic miracles one and two uh, I'm not going to read those today but I'm going to read these make some comments on it and now we're going to continue in the book of Acts why am I doing this because we need to prepare we need to prepare as a people we need to prepare and this is the mind of the Holy Spirit through the pen of our prophet. If you don't believe that, your chances of salvation are nil because then you're believing men. And we are a little, little dirt speck in the universe. The only place in the universe that believes we don't need God. Well, we're going to find out real soon. It says here, <clears throat> this is uh, page 205, Take heed that ye be not deceived, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draws near. Go ye not thereof after the, therefore after them, Luke 21.8. Well, there's a warning there, and we all know that. Jesus spoke about this. 
um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, warned us about this. In this age, Antichrist will appear as the true Christ, and then the law of God will be fully made void in the nations of our world. Rebellion against God's holy law will be full, fully ripe. But, true, but the true leader of all this rebellion is Satan, clothed as an angel of light. Men will be deceived and will exalt him to the place of God and deify him. But omnipotence will interpose and to the apostate churches that unite in the exaltation of Satan, the sentence will go forth. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. Disguised as an angel of light, he, Satan, will walk the earth as a wanderer worker. In a beautiful language, he will present lofty sentiments. Good words will be spoken by him and good deeds performed. Christ will be personified. But on one point, there will be a marked distinction. Satan will turn the people from the law of God. He will declare that the Sabbath has been changed from the seventh to the first day of the week. And as Lord of the first day of the week, he will present the spurious Sabbath as a test of loyalty to him. Folks, this is the most important battle that will ever be fought in this universe. Christ has already won this battle. We have to make a choice to be on the winning team, which will cost us everything. Everything. It is impossible to give everything here on this planet. It is impossible to give any idea of the experience of the people of God who shall be alive upon the earth with celestial glory and a reputation of the precautions of the past are blended. They will walk in the light, proceeding from the throne of God. By means of angels, there will be a constant communication between heaven and earth. And Satan, surrounded by evil angels and claiming to be God, will work miracles of all kinds to deceive, if possible, the very elect. God's people will not find their safety in working miracles, for Satan counterfeit the miracles that will be wrought. God's tried and tested people will find their power in the, uh, uh, in the sign spoken of in Exodus 31, 12 through 8. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, 12 through 18. They are to take their stand on the living word. It is written. This is the only foundation upon which they can stand securely. How important do you think it is to know? Well, go back to Exodus 31 and read verses 12 through 18 and see what she's talking about or what the Holy Spirit is talking about. Where is our only foundation? Where can it be found? You'll notice it's in the living word. It is written, period, in the Bible in the spirit of prophecy. That is the only place that there will be any kind or the absolute exposure of who this is. And yes, there will be miracles, there'll be this, there'll be that. Uh, it's gonna be amazing. And this is just before us. <clears throat> if you don't understand this, you really need to study your scriptures and stop listening to people. That's the first part. The second part. Where did this come from? Well, let's take a look. You have to go to the back to see. I want people to know. July, and that is reference 53, ninth, ninth volume of the testimonies, page 16. You will find this. The other first paragraph. 
And I'm doing this because 50 Testimony to Ministers, page 62. Many people don't even know anymore what these books are. Fundamentals of Education, page 471 and 472. That's where you find these things. That's where you're going to find them, folks. Let me tell you, and I can't emphasize this more, with this new Green Deal that our Congress has passed, electricity will be reduced if this goes all the way through. If, it's, if the Lord doesn't block it, you will not be able to use your electronics the way you are now. You won't have, it's not going to happen. If you don't believe me, go look at these communist countries in China and Russia and other areas. They have limited access to this. This is what they're wanting to do here. It's happening in Canada. So if you don't have the books and if you're not studying, you're not going to have this information. Yeah, Bill. Paul, will you explain that Green Deal? What, what is going on with that? The I'm new Green familiar. Deal. One of the things they're going to shut down, they want to shut down all the coal-fired power plants, which is the majority of them in the country. What do you think is going to happen? Electric cars, electric this, electric that. There's going, they're going, in California, there's already problems with their grid. So you can only generate so much electricity, and this is the reason they're doing this. They'll have total control. And you're going to have limited access to your electricity. It's that simple. If the Lord doesn't intervene. Because, you know, the work's not done yet, folks. And if you know your scripture, and this is the reason I want to go through the book of Acts, because I want to, we have to look at what primitive godliness is, because there's been a lot, a lot of explanations I've heard through my life in Adventism, but none of them have hit the mark because the book of Acts is primitive godliness. It's apostolic godliness. If you want to know that, read the book Acts of the Apostles along with the book of Acts, which is very clear. And you know what's amazing? <clears throat> In the book of Acts, where did the apostles find solace? Where did they find protection? Who protected them? The Seventh-day Adventists or the secular government? Which one? You find many places referenced in Acts because Paul was a Roman citizen. They couldn't do certain things to them that, that they were going to do. The law protected them until Nero totally went against that law. You see. So all this foolishness about bucking the government and this and that, this is who's protecting us right now. It's in the book of Acts. That's who protected Paul and others. It was centurions, it was governors, it was uh, 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 pretty much police and sheriffs and so on that said, hey, wait a minute, this is wrong. They weren't all corrupt. Look at Paul. How many times did the government intervene to save that man's life? And even the secular heathen guards and captains saw the intent towards him and they said wait a minute they can't do this and they protected him and then from further punishment from the roman government there was roman law you can't do this to a roman citizen you can't do that so this is part of it folks you want to run our country down and run our governments down you go right ahead but it's not in harmony with the oh yeah but pilate crucified christ yes he did and a centurion declared him to be the son of God in front of everybody. So, you know, <laughs> be, be, be careful who you condemn and who you uphold. Be careful. And this is part two of this. It's called Satan Personates Christ, part two. Pretty ample title. And no marvel, for Satan himself <clears throat> is transformed into an angel of light. Second Corinthians 11. 14. I just want to say, of course, it's Corinthians here. I just want to say one other thing. When Paul made the statement, and you'll find this in Acts of the Apostles, inspired by the Holy Spirit, that we don't fight against flesh and blood, against principalities, powers, etc., etc., in high places, he was referring to the fact, do you know, that he was being protected by the secular government, but yet, 
The spirit of evil in the Seventh-day Adventist church was trying to destroy him, the same ones that destroyed Christ. That's what Paul was referring to. I know that's a hard pill for a lot to swallow, but read it, read the context, and you will see that clearly. He realized what he was fighting against. Yeah, Cody. Just, you know, going back to the government thing, Pontius Pilate, he didn't want to crucify Christ. It was Declared the church innocent, that did. Yes. So it's like Mrs. White says, our greatest enemy will be the Adventists that fall away. And that yes. will be the majority of the conference and a lot of these fanatical independents. They're yes. going to be the ones that are going to go to court and present cases in a way that make us look as bad as possible to upset them and give us the p worst possible penalty that we could receive. It's yeah. going to be other Adventists. <clears throat> you know, Cody, you saying that, I mean, how many times is it recorded in the book of Acts that the Seventh-day Adventist leadership went to trial before these governors and rule, even Nero, the first time Paul, with false lying charges to get him put to death. How many times did they do it? And how many times, even Nero, the, the, Nero the first, Nero, he saw through it, the, the, the base man, and set him free. Okay, so, come on. Primitive godliness, apostolic godliness is not how you dress, eat, how much money you pay, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, no. It's like Paul says, I die daily. And are willing to do what Paul did and James and John, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, it's amazing. Doesn't matter. Well, Paul does mention his diet. He was a vegetarian for spiritual reasons. Not a, he doesn't say vegan. He said he will touch no flesh food as long as he lives for spiritual reasons, period. Even though it's okay, he said, on the surface, I won't do it. So you can argue. He didn't say, well, I'll eat fish and chicken. He didn't say that. No, that's not a vegetarian. That's a Roman Catholic vegetarian. <clears throat> they love that. Okay, anyhow, going back to this, because I do want to get into Acts. I want to finish out what we started last week, because there's some things I want to read from the Spirit of Prophecy that go along with those verses. It said, Satan is preparing his deception in that his last campaign against the people of God, they may not understand that it is he. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Satan will go to the extent of his power to harass, tempt, and mislead God's people. He who dared to face and tempt and taunt our Lord and who had power to take him in his arms and carry him to the pinnacle of the temple and up into an exceeding high mountain will exercise his power in a wonderful degree upon the present generation who are far inferior in wisdom to their Lord and who are almost wholly ignorant of his subtlety and his strength, being Satan's subtlety and strength, not our Lord's, there's a comma there. In a marvelous manner will he affect the bodies of those who are naturally inclined to do his bidding. You notice what it says, affect the bodies you think the health message has anything to do with this, with the third angel's message? Affect the bodies. What does that infer? The emotions, the passions, the wants. I want, I want, I want. Affect the bodies. <clears throat> he will come personating Jesus Christ, working mighty miracles, and men will fall down and worship him as Jesus Christ. We shall be commanded to worship this being whom the world will glorify as Christ. What shall we do? Tell them that Christ has warned us against just such a foe who is man's worst enemy, yet who claims to be God. And that when Christ shall make his appearance, it will be with power and great glory accompanied by 10,000 times thousands and thousands of angels and thousands of thousands. Do you know that number used in the Old English is, means an infinite number? That's pretty much what it means. And then when he shall come, we shall know his voice. 
The time is coming when Satan will work miracles right in your sight, claiming that he is Christ. And if your feet are not firmly established upon the truth of God, then you will be led from your foundation. Satan is determined to keep up the warfare to the end, coming as an angel of light, claiming to be the Christ. He will deceive the world, but his triumph will be short. No storm of tempest can move those whose feet are planted on the principles of eternal truth. They will, make, they will be able to stand in a time of almost universal apostasy. Now, it's interesting what two times it says here that those who know the truth of God and the eternal truth will not be moved. What does that mean? Well, read John 17. Sanctify them through thy word. And this is Jesus' prayer just before he's going before to be arrested and be crucified. Not for him, for us. Read John 17. Sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. So what is the Holy Spirit communicating here through Ellen White's pen? If you know the scriptures, and for all intent and purpose, folks, the time we're in, the prayer to spirit of prophecy is part of the scriptures. I'm not saying it is the Bible. She says she's the lesser light, but it explains these things. And if you don't know these things, does it say in the Bible these very things that are written on these two pages, by the way? This came from 6 BC, page 1106. It's the sixth volume of the commentaries. However, if you go there, it will tell you what publication it did come from initially. And again, this may be one of the letters or articles that was never published anywhere else. So if we don't know the truth or the word and Jesus is the word, we're lost. No man will save you. No intellect on this planet will save you. Quite the opposite. If you don't have publications, if you don't have the truth, which is the printed page, and you're not studying it, you're not going to make it. The book of Acts will bear that out. Now, you know what's amazing? As you go through the book of Acts, you don't find the apostles having these jam sessions. What I mean by that is this, this seminar and that seminar and, 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 and we're going to do this and do that. We're going to study this and that. Oh, no, they did all their studying already. They're out applying it. The main cord between all of it is the Holy Spirit and prayer. That's what sustained them. Because it had to be put in here first in order for them to use it. Now, am I saying that they didn't read and study while they were out doing? I'm sure from time to time they did. If they had it to do, because it wasn't available like it is now. They didn't have printed page here and there. They couldn't just walk into a store and buy a book for little money. Oh, no. Books were very valuable, very hard to come by. They spent time with the word in flesh. And everything that he did and said was imprinted here. And you know what? The three and a half years in Jesus' ministry, from Genesis to Revelation, he said and did all of it. You might find that to be an amazing statement, but do you think that what's written in the four Gospels is all that Jesus did? Who was it who said, I think it was John, or was it Luke? That said, I suppose if everything that he would said and did were written down, there would not be enough volumes in the world to hold it. Of course not, because it was not in this world, it was in the universe. So all of that was riveted in their brain. And they may not have recalled it, but when they came to trial, Stephen, Philip, these guys, how do you think they said all this? Where did they get it from? 
wasn't them, it was the Holy Spirit talking, just as demons speak through apostate ministers and, and so on. Yes, Cody. You know, what made me think about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the apostles going out, one of the things Paul always did was he went to the Jews first, mm -hmm. gave them an opportunity, and most of the time they rejected it, and he went to the Gentiles afterward. I wonder how similar it's going to look in the last days, if there will be a message to the church at being rejected and then a message to the Gentiles. I wonder how similar they will be. I, I think very similar. I think very similar, but the time is coming, too, when, well, let's read what Mrs. White says about this stuff. We're in Acts 1, and uh, we went through the first six, seven verses last time. I called it the commission, which is what was given to the new church. And in chapter 2, we're going to see the different structure and organization of the church and who was actually in charge of the church on earth. It's pretty clear. It's pretty clear. And it's not the system that crucified Christ anymore. That's gone. That's long gone, washed away. When Jesus said, your house is left unto you desolate in Matthew 24, that was the end of that system. What did that mean? No longer would the uh, Holy Spirit have anything to do with the temple services, the Shekinah, that's what that was. It didn't dwell in that temple. However, Mrs. White says that the second temple that was built was more glorious than the first for one reason, because Jesus himself was in that temple. So, but when he said it is finished, or your house is left unto you desolate. And that's the first time in a scripture where God referred to the temple as your house. <laughs> What's he saying? I mean, that statement is, 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 is an astronomically mind-boggling statement to anybody who's trying to comprehend who and what they are as a Seventh-day Adventist. Your house is left unto you desolate. First time in the Bible that the temple was referred to as not God's. That was it. It was over. Done. New deal. And by the way, these ragtag team here, they're the new ministers of it. But they'll be driven by a different set of rules. They're the same, but different. <laughs> I know. Go to Jeremiah 31. What is, is I'm pretty sure that I shall write my laws upon their minds and upon their hearts. That's the new deal. And who's going to do that writing? The Holy Spirit. That doesn't exist. My goodness. Okay, so I want to quickly mention Jesus' ascension. And, and it's amazing to me that nobody ever has any questions about this. Do you think it was an important event? Well, it wasn't treated that way. It was like, see you guys. By the way... You have work to do, I'm going to do my work, and that was it. And after he ascended, they're all standing there looking, and what happened? Angel came up and said, why do you look in the air? What are, what are you waiting for? Go, do your work. The reason there was not a big fanfare, the reason there weren't angel, because it would have distracted the minds of the apostles to that event. That situation, they had work to do here. Jesus gave them their commission, go and do this work. I'm going to do my work, you see, because the work had just begun for Jesus in heaven. What was he doing? He was going to the judgment. He was going to make intercession. He was going to the end of the prophecy line of 1844 to start the investigative judgment. And meaning that, well, starting to get all our business in order here on earth to cancel, to, to just cycle out of here. And it's going to be some business. So that's all I want to say about the ascension. There's a reason why it was so non-grandeur, if you will. I mean, really, when you think about it, when Jesus came into Galilee, and they were waving the palms and declaring him as Messiah. That was a much bigger event. 
It got everybody's attention on what now when he ascends after he's triumphant, wasn't a big fanfare at all. But there was a reason for it. The psychology of the human mind would have diverted the mission, and he knew that. So no, I'm going to do my work, and I'm leaving you here to do your work. And you're going to do greater things than I. Not that they would have more power than him, but that it would go all over the world. They turned the world on its head, these men did, and women. There were women involved, too. You know, a name from the past, Jim Arabito, had traced the apostles where they went <clears throat> after the dispersion from Jerusalem. And uh, I forget which ones he will tell you if you want to go to uh, that website. Um, I think it's LLC Productions. His wife still runs it in California. Fantastic material. He was a pioneer of a lot of modern day understanding of these things. There's no doubt about it. Him and his son died in a plane crash while they were tracing the Sabbath through the world. They did find that in oriental regions of the earth that they kept the seventh day Sabbath until the uh, Roman Catholic miss Jesuit missionaries got there. They had, you can find uh, in videos that he had made in front of some of the cities, there was a plaque that said, we keep the, and I'm paraphrasing, seventh day Sabbath, we don't do business on Saturday here. This is going back to the first century. So, and I believe if I'm not mistaken, it was actually John that went there. And I, I very well could be. I haven't looked at that stuff in 20 years. To which place? To uh, the Orient. I think it was China they found that placard. Thomas. Thomas. Okay, there you go. It was Thomas that did that. It's irrelevant, but there is evidence that all, every place in the world that there was civilization, one of the apostles or workers thereof hit that place with the gospel, and the Sabbath message was presented. They would have you believe, they being the religious uh, leaders or, or theologians, and that no, that's not the case. Well, it is. They preached to the whole world the gospel message. Go to LLC Productions, the evidence is there. And, I mean, the, he, Jim Arabito went to old, old libraries around the world in ancient cities and went down in the archives and dug all these old publications and books out. Uh, he was really doing something and he was actually working on that whole video about the Sabbath in the world when he died. Uh, I think his wife completed it with the information he had. However, I, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty interesting video. Yeah, Bill? You know, Paul, in, in um, B.G. Wilkinson's book, Truth Triumphant, mm -hmm. in the first chapter, he talked about the apostles and, and where they went throughout the then known world. Yes. And it, it's fascinating. It is fascinating, and that's right. It's a good study because the Sabbath was not a little known thing. And Rome has been working against this since the first century in the modern world up until now to overthrow it and has not met Rome, the devil. has not been able to, and we see to what lengths I just read out of Maranatha he's going to go to to do it. But Seventh-day Adventists, if you are not on your game with the scriptures, with the spirit of prophecy, you're not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. And one of the biggest questions is, well, how are we going to know when the devil impersonates Christ? Well, I just read to you one simple way. There's another simple way to know, too. And do you think that G the devil coming this way isn't going to fool a lot of people? Because many people don't believe Jesus came 2,000 years ago. There's question about that. Now they're talking, I, I heard, um, uh, I'm seeing about editing the Bible. It's just a book, and we can change that. Well, just like evolution. I said that last time I was up here. We can change it, make it what we want. We can change the truth. 
And you know what's amazing? Back in the 50s in, in, in Russia, one of their main slogans that they put forth to their people and the world is, religion is the opiate of humanity. God is dead. Older people remember that. But that's what they, it was resounded through newspapers and on TV throughout the world when Russia came out with that. But they're called the opiate of the masses. That's how they said it. Religion is the opiate of the masses. No, it's government, it's, it's man. And, and when you go down that route, you are actually acknowledging Luciferian authority and power. Yeah, that was the thing, the mantra. Religion is the opiate of the masses. Go look that up. You'll get a hit if you look that up. Anyhow, going back to the book of Acts, I want to continue talking about verses 7 and 8. And this is Jesus talking, and this is Acts 1. And then uh, next week, we're going to, well, move, move on. Um, and he said unto them, it is not for you to know times and seasons which the Father has put in his own power. That's when I made the statement about the Holy Spirit knowing, in my opinion, when the second coming is, because he knows the mind of God, according to Paul. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me in both Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now this commission is actually repeated several times in the New Testament by different authors. We looked at it in the book of Matthew. It's in the book of Luke. We see it here in Acts. We see it in, in uh, a couple of the other Gospels. Who was he talking to? The church? Well, yes. But the organized church? No, he was talking to fishermen, to carpenters, to day laborers. Hmm, interesting. Mrs. White says here, and I think it's important to understand this. There were to be found following the master, praying. They were to be found following the master, praying, waiting, watching, and working. They were to be representatives of the world of the character of Christ. That which was essential for a successful Christian experience in the days of the disciples is essential, essential in our day. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know times and seasons which the Father has put in his own power, but you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come unto you. I did read that last time, and I made the statement that, okay, according to many in the Adventist church. So Jesus left, went to heaven, and then came back again if you believe he's the Holy Ghost. That doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense whatsoever. So, and after the Holy Ghost was come upon them, what were they to do? And ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. This is the work in which also we also are to be engaged. Instead of living in expectation of some special season or excitement, we are wisely to improve present opportunities, doing that which must be done in order that souls may be saved. Instead of exhausting the power of our mind in speculation in the regard of times and seasons which the Lord has placed in his power and withheld from men, we are to yield ourselves to the control of the Holy Spirit to do present duties to give souls who are perishing the truth. Not scholars and theologians, anybody who reads this commission and calls themselves a Christian. This is your work. Don't have to go, and remember, I went through the vision of the berries. Right close to you, there are souls who want to hear this truth. What is the best method in this time that we're in? Well, we're even given instruction then through our publications. Many things have been written down and condensed into small, easy to understand books, especially the last movements of this earth. Give them one of those. 
Not some, oh, watch this and look at that and watch this, because then they become attached to the person. And this very thing I just read is the whole reason why there was no fanfare when Jesus left, because that would have impressed them more than this commission would have. Satan is ever ready to fill the mind with theories and calculations that will divert the mind from present truth and disqualify them from giving the third angel's message to the world. So, the third angel's message is present truth. Well, we've gone over that a million times in this place. And what goes with the third angel's message? The health message. Why? Well, you see, I just read he's going to take over appeal to their bodies. And the health message restrains that. Yeah, Cody. So powerful what you just said, because this is a big snare for a lot of people right now. Mm -hmm. It's all this calculations of, oh, we're going to have an economic crash this year, or yep. Jesus is coming this year, the sealing time ends at this time. And Mrs. White says very, the Holy Spirit rather, says very clearly right there that even to speculate on those things that you mm -hmm. are way off track mm -hmm. and you're you're disqualifying yourself from giving the third angels message which is, which is why I don't waste my time talking to people yes. that want to go over this stuff over and over and over again and you know what's amazing Cody in this book Maranatha what you just said is addressed as to exactly when that's gonna happen see because Mrs. Uh, uh, White the Holy Spirit says through her and, and I can read it until certain things happen on a spiritual level, God's favor will be on this country. So it may be because of one reason, one reason and one reason, the whole reason this country was founded, religious liberty. So up whatever Joe Biden's doing or Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump will be overruled by God until a certain event takes place. Or is it, you know what? You want to know what that is? Read this book. You'll find, or it's in the great controversy. It's in the testimonies. It's in just about every one of the publications. What that event is. And God has a special hand on the United States, she says, like no other country ever until certain events happen. So you want to speculate? You go right ahead. But there's one goal. And where is that? Come to a point in the third angel's message. Yeah, Cody. And just to connect it back to the other point that you were making earlier and you read from Mrs. White, it's all emotion-based. It's all yes. this excitement stuff. And really, yes. we're supposed to have a disinterested work ethic where we're just out an intelligent faith instead of all this emotion and all this excitement. And that's what all those messages imbue is just excitement and sporadic and fanaticism. That's another good point. Now, remind, re remember, this is all part of our commission. Do you realize how focused these apostles had to be? You want to talk about uh, 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 ancient apostolic mindset? Do you know how focused they had to be? Do you know the cities they went into? What was going on there? You think it's bad now? One church, in a seventh day, there was incest going on openly. And it was accepted because secularly it was fine. What kind of a city was that? There were cities where people were walking around naked. The most corrupt cities to ever be on this planet. Uh, uh, you think it's bad now? And when we're told Jesus says as it was in Sodom and Gomorrah before the flood, I have no idea what that must have been like. Because even the things that are described, and I believe Corinth, Corinth was one of the cities that was so corrupt and wicked. It wasn't as bad as Sodom and Gomorrah. So I, I can't imagine. So the events, and what I was going to say, as Cody has brought out or, or mentioned, as Mrs. White said, the emotions, sight, how we feel is what the devil's going to attack. This is why... And when you say the third angel's message, you better have the proper health message. Because you see, in this book, again, right after what I just read, I might read it next week, I don't know, because this is all part of the commission. We have to be so focused on Christ and him crucified. Because out him crucified in us, meaning I die daily, Jesus said, pick up your cross and follow me. There is no Holy Spirit. 
Therefore, there's nothing but deception for you. It talks about the working of miracles and about medical miracles that are going to take place. You know how many people are off on a tangent on medical missionary in the Seventh-day Adventist Church? And that's in the independence. There's very little studying to be done in medical missionary work. And what I mean by that is, yes, there's things to learn. But where does the power come from? Who directs the person? The Holy Spirit. So without the indwelling, and you see the Holy Spirit plays a big role here, you will be so deceived when you see the devil healing people. Because you see, if you're, how many people I know that pay money to go to these schools? Really? Where is that in the scripture? Where do you find that in the spirit of prophecy? And week after week and month after learning to be medical, what does that mean? And I hear the only work we'll be able to do soon is medical missionary work. But what does that mean? But if it's the right arm of the third angel's message, that statement also goes along with the only work we'll be able to do is evangelism. That's the way I read it. It is not the present truth message. It is part of of the present truth message. And the only place, and I just read, <clears throat> that we can get the wisdom for that is from the scripture and from the spirit of prophecy, which, again, is the mind of the Holy Spirit. But then if you don't believe there's a Holy Spirit, then he doesn't have a mind. So don't worry about it. Go to the miracle sessions. Go to the miracle sessions. You want to know how to do medical missionary work? Learn all about the third angel's message first. And by the way, a lot of Seventh-day Adventists don't know this. What will happen prior to the third angel? There's a message that goes before the third angel's message or will be presented for a time simultaneously, the second angel's message. Why? What is the purpose of that? Because it was not heated when it was first given, and you have an ecumenical movement because of it. People have to come out of that in order to partake of the third angel's message. The second angel's message will be repeated, which I think is going on right now. Come out of her, my people. We are so entangled in our medical institutions. You see now there is a movement uh, Governor DeSantis is ordering an investigation into shots because there's so much corruption. And guess who's right up there in Florida on that? You don't think that the Lord is not going to visit the Adventist medical system for what they've done the last two or three? He has to. He, when? I don't know. I'm not a prophet. I'm not putting forth an event, but I do know that he will because it was an attack on the third angel's message. And you think God is going to stand still for that? In his time. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. To me, a thousand years is as a second, and a second is as a thousand years. So what I think the time period it should be done in is irrelevant. Nor will I, but I do know it's going to happen because we're told these things. God is not mocked. He will not have his name put on that system because it is important. It is part of the third angel's message. He's not going to have it counterfeited for long, just as the Sabbath will not be counterfeited for long. So she says here, <clears throat> it has ever been thus, for our Savior has often had to speak reprovingly of those who indulge in speculation and ever inquiring into the things which the Lord has not revealed. Jesus has come to earth to impart important truth to men, and he wishes to impress their minds with the necessity of receiving and obeying his precepts and instructions, of doing their present duty, and his communication were on the order that imparted knowledge for the immediate and daily use Hmm. Jesus said, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. All this was done and said, had 
this one object in view to rivet the truth in their minds that they might attain unto everlasting life. Jesus did not come to astonish men with some great announcement or some special time when some great event would occur, but he came to instruct and save the lost. I did read that last time. I wanted to read that again because I think it's important for me to understand that. I don't know about you. He didn't come to bring some great event. No, the truth must be riveted on my people so I can commission him. This is why it wasn't a big deal when he ascended. Go do your work. Why, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing in the air? He'll come back again, then it'll be a big deal. Not now, go do your work. I want to read a couple of more things here, and then we're going to be out of time. <clears throat> this is about verse 8. Christ determined that when he ascended from the earth, he would bestow a gift on those who had believed on him and those who should believe on him. What gift could he bestow rich enough to signalize and, uh, and grace his ascension to the uh, meditorial throne? It must be worthy of his greatness and his royalty. He determined to give his representative, the third person of the Godhead. Uh-oh. Now that did not come out of evangelism. I promise you that. I do not believe that Mr. Throom had anything to do with this. This is the uh, study Bible. This came out of... Uh, Southwestern publication, November 28, 1905. It was a newspaper, I guess, that they put out. Did you hear that? But I'm not to believe that. I'm to believe the people who say that that Leroy Throom was there or whatever. Like I said, in that book, the whole book is fine except for three pages. You've got to rip them out and throw them away. Okay which evidently he didn't write because you see it's here already. Mrs. White wrote it. I love this Bible, folks. It's the Seventh-day Adventist Bible. I don't know how people get by without one. Let me read that again. He did determined to give his representatives the third person of the Godhead. And you know what? If you believe the spirit of prophecy, who's inspiring her to write this? <laughs> the third person of the Godhead. This gift could not be excelled. Why do you think the devil is seeking to get it away from God's people? Because they know, he knows what happened back here in the first century when the commission went forth and they accepted it. He knows that they preached the gospel to the entire world. Through what agency? The Holy Spirit, not the internet. And it's going to happen again with more power. This that uh, converting, enlightening, and sanctifying power would be his donation. Christ longed to be in a position where he could accomplish the most important work by few and simple means. The plan of redemption is comprehensive, but its parts are few, and each part depends on the other. While all work together with the uttermost simplicity and, the enti and entire harmony, folks, that's why I say the health message and what's happened in Adventism in the last two or three years is going to be brought up again by God. This is one of the intricate parts of the third angel's message that has been gutted. You think God is not going to make that abundantly clear? But only those who have the Holy Spirit will see this. Christ is represented by the Holy Spirit. Now, by the way, everything I'm reading here about the Holy Spirit is capitalized. And when this Spirit is appreciated, and you'll notice, is Christ the Holy Spirit? <laughs> or represented? What does that mean? That it's him representing him? That's foolishness. That's foolishness. And when the Spirit is appreciated, when those controlled by the Spirit communicate to others the energy which they are imbued, an invisible cord is touched which electrifies the whole. Would that we could all understand how 
boundless are the divine resources. It is the union of the, of the Holy Spirit and the testimony of the living witness that is to warn the world. The worker of God is the agent through which the heavenly communication is given and the Holy Spirit gives divine authority to the word of truth. April 4, a review and herald, April 4, 1893. So there's a few quotes for you about the Holy Spirit. How, when Jesus said, go teaching and baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, the third person of the Godhead has to be involved and part of the people that are bringing present truth. If it's not, then it's the devil's work. I don't care what words you're saying. And if you don't believe there's a Holy Spirit, then you'll not be part of this. And when the devil comes, as I read, guess who you're going to be walking around behind? And you're going to be keeping Sunday, and you're going to be attacking the apostles, as was in the first century. I'm not saying people working will be apostles, but I mean the workers. I'm bringing it back to them. So that, it completes that part of the commission in my mind and how important it is that we understand why Jesus did what he did before he left, just before he left, I think. Let's pray. We're out of time. Heavenly Father, be with your people. That is such an understatement. The events that are about to unfold, when we don't know, we have no idea. But Jesus said where to pay attention to what is going on and know that we need to get ready to do this work. Not just to claim to be Seventh-day Adventists, but we must become like these apostles were. This is primitive godliness. Not to follow the customs and religions and dogmas of, of earth, but to walk the lonely path of Jesus Christ. And we must die daily and be crucified daily and be filled with your spirit. To do this work out of choice, there'll be no other way. Be with your people. Help us to awake. Help us to study like never before so that we can go put it into effect. This is a war, and there is the most important battle coming up very soon, and we're going to be on one side or the other. We praise you and thank you for the Sabbath day, and may everyone be on Christ's side. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.